With me today is Dr. Elizabeth Pritchard and Christine Burns from the Walt Institute, a coaching, training and research company. Elizabeth and Christine help women in STEM collaborate, get promoted and be successful. Welcome, ladies, and thanks for joining me today. Thank Hello. you, Christine. Hello to everybody. Yes. <sighs> So we'll get to how you started the Walt Institute shortly, but I first wanted to talk to you both about how you got here. So Elizabeth, you completed a Doctor of Philosophy at Monash University and a Master's of Health Sciences at the University of South Australia. And Christine, you completed a Bachelor of Arts and Postgraduate Diploma of Sports Psychology at Massey University. So tell me, what were your plans post-university the first time? <laughs> um, play hockey, have fun and see what happens <laughs> that was honestly my plans because i i did my degree in psychology and then i was like oh i need to keep going to university so i can keep playing hockey for new zealand and keep going overseas and doing my trips like this is honest here this is right up <laughs> and then i was like oh shit now what can i do and so i basically stayed at university because it was the easiest thing to do so six years later after i'd done all this stuff and then i was like oh what do i do and then I sort of liked the whole sport exercise science thing. So I went and started working in a gym so that I could still go to hockey trainings and still keep fit. And then I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I kind of kept, I, I guess there was this unknown thing that kept drawing me to sport, kept drawing me to why do people do what they do and making sure that I was having fun doing each of those kind of things. And Elizabeth? <laughs> yeah. So for me... I did my degree in occupational therapy in New Zealand and at the end of that I always thought that I'd just work for a few years and then get married and have babies and because that was sort of what I'd known and grown up with at that time. So yes, I'm a little bit older than the, the millennials today <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's that's sort of what I was like, oh yeah, I've got a, you know, I've, I've got the ability to learn, I've got a degree that can take me places. And then I became a full-time mum and decided, hmm, this wasn't actually for me being a full-time mum. So I then began my career in occupational therapy, which spanned over 25 years, and then moved into education and research. And so it has taken me incredible places and spaces and times, and we've, I've been able to coach and train incredible people in Australia, New Zealand, and indeed over the world as well, because of what I had invested way back then. So amazing journeys, and I think it sort of points out that you don't have to know where you want to go, you know, when you finish when you finish school and you're starting at your university no, sort of journey, no, because there's very few people that stay on that path. But I did mm -hmm. want to ask you, Christine, about sport. So did you always play hockey, and how did you become, you know, a representative of New Zealand, and how stressful was that? Um, I I started playing hockey in my last year at school. Um, the I had been playing soccer and playing cricket and softball, and I just been playing lots of sports. And then I started to have trouble with my knees, and the doctor said to me, "Hey, look, you're going to have to stop because we need to work out what's going on." And I was like, mm, "That's not going to happen." And then <laughs> the hockey team at school, they were like, "We need a goalie." I'm like, "Yeah, anybody can stand a goal and kick a ball. Like seriously, that's you just like stop the ball and kick it." And then I, they gave me all this gear and I had no idea what to do with it. And I was like, how do I put this stuff on? And so I put the gear on and I was like, hey, it's kind of cool. And then I went to a couple of trainings and I'm like, I'm kind of good at this. Like it's not too hard for me to keep learning and keep doing this stuff. And so I, I adapted to it very quickly. Within my second year of playing, I was in the New Zealand indoor hockey team. Wow. And it just kind of, it just kind of grew and grew and grew from there. And it was, I found it. I wouldn't say stressful because I liked the feeling of the challenge. Um, I mean, even times I, I, I think I was in the third or fourth year of playing, I was pulled into what we call the Central Districts team. So it was sort of the bottom of the North Island and the top of the South Island. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like I'm playing with these people that I used to watch and go, holy shit, they're really good. And then the next thing we were playing against Argentina and England and all this kind of stuff, and I'm like, Wow, this this is me, and I, I I kept rising to the challenge, and I and I liked the challenge, which it might sound a bit weird to people, but it was that thing of going, I liked that feeling, and I and I kind of thrived on it, and and so for me it was that thing to go, I love being in a team, I love being in a group, I love having something that stretches me, and pretty much how 
how I bring myself to coaching and training is how I play sport. <laughs> so I have to be in the right mindset to turn up to do any performance. I want to bring the best out in the people that I work with and I'm going to give them everything I possibly can. Like my my motto when I was on the turf playing in goal was that you will not take me off here unless you take me off in a box. So I, I had many injuries, <laughs> and, and it's not a claim to fame. It's quite stupid, really, but it, now that I look back on it. But at the time, it was like I just gave everything to every single game. Like I would be there, I would give everything I've got, and then I'd sort myself out later. And and pretty much that's just kind of what I do now, really, <laughs> for each client, for each group, for each organisation, yeah. And so how do you think competition and being in a team in general set you up for your later career? Um, yeah it, it was it taught me to handle things very quickly um one of my and I guess it's a superpower <laughs> um is that I don't get stuck in the problem I don't get stuck in that I'm very quick at getting to how I solve that stuff and how I can work through it um so I don't deny what's going on I see it for what it is you know if, I mean if, if I don't get selected for a team and there was there was quite a few teams that I didn't get selected for I'd have my nano tanty I would be like, you know, what do I need to do to get in there? What can I do to improve myself? And I would go and I'd talk to the people that were in the know. I'd push myself to be able to do it mentally, physically, emotionally. And then I'd be like, right, when's my when's my opportunity to be able to get myself back out there and show that I've got the goods? And that that gets me to to thrive in, in, in those challenging situations. And being in a team is everything to me. Like I you can't is, the thing is you can't do anything on your own as much as people go oh i'm self-made blah 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 blah. sure but who bought your product who who helped you out in the background who cooked your meals you know simple little things who who did the you know little things for you so they're all part of your team and for me my team is my team is everything you know like we all have to be on that same page but all bring different strengths to the situation and I, I, it's why I don't like a you know a vertical hierarchy. I'm very much in a flatter hierarchy because everybody brings their strengths. Mm -hmm. I can't do their job. They can't do mine. We might be able to do little bits, but that's how we bring our expertise and make a, a real solid unit is, is the only way for me to be able to go forward. Yeah, I think teamwork definitely does help you with that. It's, um, oh. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? Especially yeah. to know your sort of place in, in, in a way. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask um, you, Elizabeth, so obviously our formative years really guide us into how we're going to be as adults. And, you know, you were the youngest of nine children and you said that you were bullied and sexually abused as a child. So I don't really want to go too darky, but I think it's important to talk about it and how those um, situations formed the person that you became. Mm. I think for many years I fought that those were part of me mm. and it wasn't until probably 10 years ago that I recognized that the past doesn't define me but it is part of me and I wouldn't be here today mm -hmm. doing what I do and the person I am today without that past and so I've come to terms with it I've come to accept it I've come to recognize that as shit as it was that those experiences have absolutely totally shaped who I be mm. and if I wanted to stay back there and hold myself back in the limiting beliefs that I had I could absolutely and I did for many many years for decades I held myself back in those limiting beliefs and those things that affected me were things like I can't be seen nobody wants to listen to me I'm not good enough mm. why should they I don't deserve this and so they were all the limiting beliefs that I had accumulated from all of those situations. And I had lots of other sort of positive things in my life as well. <laughs> but it was like I had, I had accumulated those limiting beliefs right through many decades of my life. And it, it was, as I said, in the last decade, I've come to recognise that they are a very precious part of me, but they do not determine me or who I be going forward. So I think it's really admirable that you talk about it because I know obviously in the news at the moment there's a lot of, you know, sexual assault and things like that are really at the forefront of people's mind, but people don't really talk about it. You know, yeah. they might grab a headline, but people don't talk about it. So how did you 
learn to build up the resilience that you did. Did you seek out um, help or did you sort of use your own skills and know-how to to overcome those challenges? Well, my own skills and know-how sort of got me in the shit. <laughs> 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 and it's like, that sort of happened for many years in different ways and it was like, oh, okay, so this isn't really working. I need to do something differently here because I'm just doing the same thing again and again and again and going, yes, I was still growing and developing and, yes, my, my resilience was still getting stronger a little bit as we do because we all have resilience and we can all learn mm. and grow if we reflect on it and if we choose to. So we can grow our resilience, absolutely. It's like being at the gym and you grow a muscle. So there were, there were some natural times and experiences that I, I learned and, and grew throughout those decades, absolutely. But I remember even, even up to about three and a half years ago, three years ago, the first time I put this out publicly mm -hmm. was on our website. Wow. And that was only three years ago. Wow. <laughs> Up until then, there was only a few people in my life who knew that. And within that, oh, I was bloody shit scared. <laughs> I was yeah. absolutely so scared about it. It was like, what are people going to think? Some people will think, oh, they're just after the, the sympathy vote. Me, me, me. Other people will go, oh, my gosh, that's just so big and huge. I'm, not, I'm out of here because it's too hard. Other people have gone, oh, my gosh, that's similar to me. And look what where you have been able to get through to and what you've been able to grow and develop and so that was the purpose I put it up in the Facebook page as part of my bio and our website and in, in our website waltoninstitute.com it was like that is the first time that it went up there about three years ago and it, it's been again part of the journey of coming to terms with this is part of me I didn't create that I didn't create the bullying and the sexual harassment I was a child and the whole way of changing my mindset around that and recognizing it doesn't take the driving seat in my life mm. anymore. And so releasing the power it had over me by going, yep, I was sexually abused. And within our programs, this often comes up, not always, yes. but it sometimes comes up when it's relevant. I will share a little bit about that because it helps other people to open up and go, oh, my gosh, I've had this trauma here. We don't sit in the trauma. We revisit it. We don't relive it. Mm. We just peek at it and go, that is part of an awesome part that has helped me be me. And we can choose to have post-traumatic growth if we do, or we can choose to stay in the shit. Yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really good that you do talk about it and, you know, do share it within your programs because, you know, Christine, obviously you're able to share, you know, this super positive experience yeah. in, in your youth as, you know, from a sportsman perspective. But then yeah. when we talk about something that's not so, you know, so great and not so, um, I suppose, comfortable to talk about, people want to shut down. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's quite sad because it, it doesn't matter what we experience in our past, it all forms who we are so mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that you're doing fantastic and keep on sharing it's it's wonderful thank you now christine i just wanted to touch on quickly you're currently authoring a book so yep. could you tell me a little bit about that uh the book came about um 2016 second of december uh second of november sorry i had a cancer diagnosis and the the way I handled it was now looking back on it and sort of, sort of, you know, stepping back from things. It's like, well, you know, I admit I, I handled it differently to what many people do. And so the whole point of me doing that book in a way is for me to, to share opportunities, to share possibilities, to share different ways of dealing with the crap. Um, and so it doesn't matter what for me. Yep. It was a cancer diagnosis. Um, and then went through all the treatment, all that kind of stuff. And the way I held my mindset, the things I did on a day-to-day -day basis, the way I set myself up, you know, same kind of thing as getting ready in the morning to go to treatment. It was like I had my pre-performance routine, you know, and I set myself up like I was going to be there for game time, ready to go, no matter what was going on, no matter how knackered I was, no matter how sick I felt, none of that stuff. It was I didn't allow that to determine, like Elizabeth was saying, I didn't allow that to determine who I be because 
I am the person that is able to go, I'm going to put this performance routine, pre-performance routine in place, and this is what I'm going to do. And here's my focus. Here's my mindset. Didn't always work. Um, there were slip ups, there were trips. And it's that kind of stuff to share with people is not so much the story of going through cancer. Um, it was how I dealt with it, how I was able to put processes and systems in place. And it's what, I mean, it, I, I, I practiced, you know, all I did really <laughs> minimize the whole thing not really but <laughs> i i just practiced what we preach and mm. and that was the coolest thing was like going i did this i did this this is what what the outcome was here was the story around it so it's kind of like a i guess a teaching memoir um and it's basically about limitless possibilities when you're going through adversity and so that's what i it, it it's that experience with the how to's and and that's what the book's about yeah, because I was going to ask you, do you did you feel that when you were going through those cancer treatments and the the way that you dealt with it, did you think that it was sort of just like putting on a mask? But it sounds more like it was just inherently who you are. It's how you deal with things and how you cope with things, and you just yep. you know you ran straight through it. You charged at it. Is is that what you think? Yeah, it's um, I mean, the whole thing that I really hung on to was to go. How can I be my best version? every single day and some days I was feeling really good other days I was definitely not so but I was like even if I'm at 40 percent how can I bring my 40 out of 40 for this particular situation and so I mean everything that we do is based on the science of happiness the science of well-being so I went right what bit of that can I implement today how can I bring that bit into today how can I get my mindset to be where it needs to be um, you know, I, st I still suffered a lot of the side effects, but there were also many times where I would go for my checkups and they'd be like, okay, so at this point, you should be experiencing this, 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 and this. And I'm like, I've got those two, but I haven't got those two. Like, what? Mm -hmm. How? What? And it was like, mm -hmm, the power of the mind, you know, and it's because I, I just kept being myself. I mean, there was time I was laughing and joking, you know, many a time, like Elizabeth would come in with me as well sometimes to treatment. And we'd be walking in the door and, you know, like you walk into the hospital and you turn left and you go to Peter Mac Cancer Centre. And I'm like, the first time I was in there, I had surgery. I'm like, oh, shit, I hope I never have to go there. And guess what? <laughs> I was working there many days. And, and so it was like, we'd always walk in there, be laughing and joking. Even when I was on my own, I'd be laughing and joking with people in the waiting rooms, laughing and joking with the staff. And it was like, why not? Why, why am I going to sit in there and cry and get all upset and me, 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 go to the garden and eat worms, which might sound a bit tough for some people, but it's like me is to have fun. It's my top value. My parents were Scottish and, you know, like life was fun. Life was tough, you know. Many a day mum would cry herself to sleep wondering how the hell we're all going to afford things and sort stuff out. But from mum and dad, and it is that innate thing in me, it was like you go out there and you give it your best shot. And if it knocks you down, you get back up and you face that crap and you go right through it and you do it with a smile on your dial. And and same thing, I built my team around me. And my team, my medical team, uh, I love them to bits and they love me to bits. So it's we get the best out of each other. And that was what the one thing that I knew is that if I can be my best self, they're going to be their best selves and I'm going to get the best. Yeah. It's such a good mindset to have. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's move on to the Walt Institute. So you founded that together for about four years ago. So mm -hmm. firstly, I wanted you to talk me through why you decided to do this and why you decided to come together and to, and to found the Walt Institute. But first of all, how did you meet? How did you become friends? Where's this story <laughs> going? How's the story going? We used to work together. We met, yes. we met many years ago in New Zealand. Uh, Christine was running the the. Um, nationally recognised exercise science and sports psychology program in the mm -hmm. institute that we both ended up working together in. So, and mm -hmm. I was doing the um, health leadership program for managers and health, and so I that was my first part parting from occupational mm -hmm. therapy practice into the world of education. So I joined this whole big world of tertiary education <laughs> and, and, so, and I met all these people and Christine was one of them. Yeah. That's awesome. Just as a bit of a side note, so you did your PhD in three years. How did you do that? Yes. <laughs> I just want some here. So how did you actually achieve that? Because that is amazing. 
Yes, and, and something I'm super proud of as well is that I did it when I started my PhD when I was 49. Wow. And I moved countries to do it, mm. to a place where I only knew two people. Oh, so, scary. Yeah, it was, it was a bit scary. It was pretty scary. And so to me, there's a whole lot around that. It's not just having that qualification. Mm. To me, it's the determination, the dedication, the perseverance, the times when it was like, this is so freaking hard. Mm -hmm. How am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And and recognising and acknowledging and finding out, I guess, yeah, it was the finding out what was really inside me. And it was like, oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And now every day, that sort of set the standard. Every day it's like, how can, I, how can I play at a higher level? How can I raise my standards today? How can I raise my standards today? And this is not about perfectionism because that's a whole lot of BS. Yep. Because if we think about perfectionism, then we never do anything and we don't take action. This is about raising my standards here to be, to have more meaning beyond myself, to contribute to humanity, to contribute to the people in STEM that we work with so that they can be more authentically who they are mm. and they can learn some of these amazing things as well. That's fantastic. It's very inspirational to, to even do a PhD, let alone to do it in three years. It's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's jump back to the Walt Institute. So you, you formed it together. Now, mm -hmm. why? What was your driving purpose for coming together and to doing what you do for STEM? We, um, we were both doing very similar things, doing it in a different way, and went, we can't work together. We, we do it differently. It wouldn't work. And then we were like, hang on a minute. You're doing this to improve. So this is me. I'm doing this to improve their performance, to get them to perform at their best and be their best version of themselves every day. Liz is out there changing mindsets, setting in place awesome leaders, getting people to find out their worth so that they know that they are actually enough. And, and you know, between us, it was like, we, we both want the same thing for people. Yep. Okay, cool. We do it differently. Hey, that might work. <laughs> and then we went, oh, maybe we should just put this together. And then we were working with, we were at a, um, a pitch. So we were delivering a pitch one a day at one of the days. And this random guy was there, no idea who he was, tapped me on the shoulder. And he was like, oh, Christine. And I had just done the, the business pitch and we wanted mentors and some, some funding and stuff as well to get going. Tap me on the shoulder. I had gone first, second, first, whatever it was. And he says, oh, Christine, just want to talk to you. Um, I'm, you know, so-and-so, lurly -so, And it was like, oh, okay, cool. Half an hour later, he gives us his card and he says, how about you come around and meet, you know, my partner as well, business partner. And he said, because we really like what you do. We work in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. And we were like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and and then it was, uh, and he's like, there's a real gap in STEM for what you do. And then we started going, hey, this is kind of cool. And the more that we've stepped into it, the more that we've worked in there, like I'm like a secret closet geek. Um, <laughs> but you know, sporting secret closet Yeah, geek. like get there. How about that? I've got brains as well as broad. She reads more books than, you than I do. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's, it was that kind of thing. And it was just, for me, it's fun. It's a challenge because I'm like, it's these people that, it's, it's really good. Like these people that are hugely, highly skilled in what they do and have amazing qualifications, their skills and techniques and what they do and how they can change the world. It's freaking awesome. And then Elizabeth's got this ability to get inside people's heads, to be able to go, you are enough and draw out that awesome thing about who they are and their true, authentic selves. And so between the two of us, it's quite a good impact on, on the world of STEM because yeah. they're really good in their intellectual side of things, their logical brain works, their qualifications are amazing, and the stuff they produce is very good. But for them as themselves, as an individual, as a person, as a human being and who they be, nada. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's our whole thing of getting in there and when you truly be your true authentic self, all of the rest of, you know, the quali qualifications, the, the things you produce, the things you do, the results you gain, the cures, the scientific things, the innovation, the creativity, the new stuff that's out there, that goes up another level at the same time. Mm. And I think the other thing too is we recognise that there's a whole lot of leadership programmes mm. out there that have systems and processes for being traditional, traditional systems and processes for creating your leadership. And it's almost like a one-size-fits-all. 
and it focuses on the system, the process, the change management system, the the way you do 360 surveys yeah. with people and interviews, yeah. the way you run whatever you run. And so we we saw this this huge gap of the people themselves are not being developed yep. and to be able to step into their own power and go forward. And many, many people in STEM, like I work with, I mean, I'm I'm seen as one of the baby people in STEM. I'm an, I'm an early to mid-career researcher at, at six years post PhD. So <laughs> so it's like uh, in, in the world of STEM, I'm sort of way down the echelon of, of the hierarchy and there's so many people above me, mm. that's how it's perceived. I don't perceive it like that. <laughs> and, and so there, there's thousands and thousands of people who have all these amazing qualifications, run labs, have teams around them, and they're still seen as very low mm. on the hierarchy. And then, therefore they're not seen or heard. And this is, this is an issue that's not being addressed. Mm. Yes. That several people up in different places get the traditional leadership training and processes. However, we're not growing and developing the person mm. to keep going. And the attrition rate in the whole world of STEM is huge. I think there's something like only 22% of women stay beyond year nine or something of working in STEM yeah. because of many, many challenges. And, and so it's about let's strengthen who they are and mm. who they be and see how that has a ripple effect so that they stay longer so we have we have higher uh, we have less attrition we have more women in, in higher levels of leadership and we have a greater collaboration across men women genders yes. diversity everything within stem yeah absolutely and i wanted to talk about diversity in a moment but I just wanted to discuss, so Christine, you're also a teaching associate in the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at Monash University, and you're a former lecturer at RMIT University and Wellington Institute of Technology, where Elizabeth also lectured. Yeah. So what role do you both believe that learning institu institutions should play in the teaching of the soft skills? And, and this <laughs> sort of for the openness and vulnerability, that's something that I was actually, um, so I'm not, I'm not doing that work now, um, now I'm full time in our business, which is great. And, and that partly was my decision. And I finished a tutorial one day and I walked out of there and went, it was dark. I walked out of there on my way to the train. I was like, that's it. Enough is enough. And I had been, uh, you can hear it in my voice. I had been, <laughs> Um, I'd been hauled over the coals basically for wanting to teach soft skills and for bringing it into what I was teaching. And I was like, but these students need to learn more about how to learn, you know, who, who they are and, and how to do this stuff, not just the what of learn this, learn this, learn this. Like they're not little robots, you know, if they enjoy things or they go, oh my gosh, I don't learn it this way, I learn it this way. Oh my gosh, now I can still learn it. This is awesome. And, and so that was something that I always did in all of my classes was to, I would come up with all sorts of ways of teaching whatever the concepts were and I would tweak and change things too. And and then I was hauled over the coals for not sticking to the system, not sticking sticking to the traditional ways of, but it's always been done that way, so it has to, not in my world. And, and for me, it's the soft skills are, which I, I hate that they're called soft skills. Mm. And I know that so many people, they, they, <laughs> they are really hard. They're the most challenging things to learn. Like anybody can learn a skill. You can like read that shit off the board, put it in here, regurgitate that stuff, and you don't have to understand it or you ever reproduce it again. <laughs> it's the stuff about here, you know, like how do you get up and do a presentation? How do you be heard? How do you be seen? When, you, when you're really scared, and I used to be at school, like I couldn't even read a paragraph, you know, like the old school days of you'd read a paragraph and it would go around the class and I'd be like, I was number eight, and I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. and I always remember that, and I'm like, I, I don't want anybody to go through that in my classes, mm -hmm. and so my thing was that I want every, I wanted every, and I still do, wanted every single student, every person I work with to be able to have, do, be exactly me and more, and, and that's where those skills come in. They are the absolute key skills before any other stuff, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So do you think we'll see any change with institutions, you know, trying to, to do that? Obviously, you were hauled over the coal, so it doesn't sound promising. But do, do you think there is any change developing 
within the universities? Yeah, there's there's a lot being pushed, and, and that's the thing I love about positive psychology is there's now we see it in a lot of schools. You know, even little tackers, um, whatever little yeah little tackers, um, you know, and and it starts early in life. Five, six, seven year olds. Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> what do you call it? Um, so little tackers, you know, we see it in in high schools now, and we see it coming through into universities. And I know one of the cool things in America is that I can't remember the exact university. Um, Laurie Santos, her her paper that she does on positive psychology on on the you know on the science of happiness, is the highest attended paper in that university. So wow. you got people doing you know engineering degrees, business degrees, um, science degrees, everything in between that are enrolling in her paper, and and that's happening in many universities that I'm I'm aware of overseas as well. And so a lot of what's happening is that. There are some, you know, like um, University of Melbourne, um, and there are others as well around the place that I'm aware of that are instigating, and a lot of they call it positive education. New Zealand's doing it too. You know, there's there's a group in New Zealand that are that are really pushing it. So it's positive education that's coming through, and they're learning mindfulness. They're learning how to be happy. They're learning about themselves, and 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 I see that as a positive. And I, for me, it's that thing to keep sharing that stuff with people too so that it's like I didn't know what I wanted to do mostly do now um but the only way I've been able to discover that and feel good about it is to keep implementing positive education positive psychology the science of happiness the science of well-being and that keeps me having that ability to be able to share all that information with people and I've got students now that I mean, I taught like 17, 18 years ago that are still in touch with me and going, Bernsey, I remember when you said blah, blah, blah in class. <laughs> and it was to do with those soft kind of skills and that's what they're implementing in their lives. You know, I've got people that I worked with at RMIT or students I worked with at RMIT that are now, they thought they were going in one direction, sat down, basically had career counselling with them. <laughs> but it was the, the positive psych side of things and now the, I mean, you know, for example, one's a nurse and two of them are social workers. And it's like, if I can impact that, and then from little tackers through high schools, through into these universities now that are doing it, it's happening. Like the ripple effect is happening. Mm. Yeah. That's really important because, as you said, if we've got women leaving after sort of nine years, that's really concerning. That's, that's a really high attrition. Mm. Yeah. So tell me about the clients that you guys look after. Our clients are amazing. <laughs> we <love them. laughs> That's so, cool. so we work with researchers, academics, executives and post-grad students mm. and professionals who are, who are in STEM. Yep. So as we said before, STEM is science, technology, engineering, math and medicine. And we can work with anybody from the finance department in a university through to a professor and a, and a CEO of a yep. health institute. So people come to us to because they sort of assimilate with they get attracted to, to what we teach basically mm -hmm. and it's like as Christine said before they are hugely academically amazing and there's something that, that trips them up yep so it may be that they don't like confrontation and they want to they want to work a way through that mm -hmm. to to seek clarity and to change their mindset around this always trips me up yep. how can I change that there are people who go, I can't apply for those grants because I don't think I'll get them. Or I'm really not good at networking and collaborating. I'm not sure how to do it. So they come in with these types of things that they want. And then we take them through our processes and our programs and we coach them and we train them and inspire them. And, and they come through recognising that it's like, oh, it's about who I mm. be, not what the system <laughs> demands of me. And so we have we have amazing ways of going through this. I mean, last night we, we're oh. just finishing today a five-day challenge. So this is a free challenge that we often do free challenges in our closed nice. Facebook group. Which is leading authentically with Christine and Elizabeth, or Elizabeth and Christine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and people can join there. And we put a whole lot of free things in there. And so we're partway through our five day live challenge this week, which finishes today actually, where we give away a scholarship as well. Mm. It's so exciting. And <laughs> and 
we've just had the most amazing changes and metamorphosis from people by giving a little bit of training, 30, 40 minutes a day, giving them a challenge. They do the challenge. They take action because successful people take immediate action. Mm. And so they take action. We've set it up so they're safe. It's a safe environment for them to put themselves out there a little bit, feel the fear a little bit, feel the feel the <laughs> feel the unfamiliarity, and they do it. Yep. And they get all these goodies and bonuses, and and it's just amazing. And then last night we did a live oh, coaching yeah. with somebody, and she was absolutely incredible. And within twelve minutes, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> twelve minutes, get surprised us as well. Within twelve minutes. She was going, oh, my gosh, I feel so free. And I've just let all this stuff go from the past about my work. And, oh, my gosh, I feel so amazing. And this was an hour coaching session. So we even went further Mm. and deeper. And it was just brilliant. And that's what inspires us. We know that our proven strategies work. They're based on evidence-based strategies that we work for authentic leadership. And we know it works. And we just get so excited to work with people who want to come work with us. And it's like we're not we're not the cup of tea for everyone. No. And that's absolutely <laughs> fine. I think in businesses you have to recognise that. And it's like you either attract or repel. Mm. And you're either attracted to our energy and our dynamism and the way we do things, or you're not. And that's absolutely fine. Yeah. It's absolutely fine. So that's sort of that's who we work with. So how do people find you guys? Do you advertise? Is it word of mouth? We, bit of everything. Well, a bit of everything. I mean, we've got we've got all our social media platforms. Um, so we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, and so all of that is um, you know under Walt Institute. And then there's also the Facebook group under Leading Authentically with Elizabeth and Christine. We um, a lot of it too with our clients is word of mouth. So we've now had people that are starting to go, "Hey, I heard about you through so and so," and. I mean, the good link is that with Elizabeth being at Monash as well, we are able to do, you know, to let people know what programs are coming up and let, let people know what's going on. And then that sort of gets dispersed throughout the whole university. We've got, I mean, you know, I've, I've still got connections with people at different universities here. So send them something. Um, you know, we let people know what's coming up directly so we we do have our friendlies that that we email information to and we have our website and on our website um like if people want to go there on vaultinstitute.com the simple things too is like we've got we give away stuff so on on the front page of our website we've got four ebooks that people can just go into vaultinstitute.com go down the page and they'll find those free ebooks mm. so it's our thing is about adding value to people and, and that's how a lot of people are like, hey, wow. So, like, I don't have to do any weird, freaky stuff, you know, <laughs> before you even sit. No, no, you, you just go and get that free stuff and you use it and you get the value because mm-hmm. our thing to ha- is to have the biggest impact that we can possibly have across the world. It's not, it's not just about one little area that we want to do. And it's, I mean, between us, we've got contacts all over the place as well. So it's, for us, it's word of mouth. It's our, it's our, Database. media platforms it's our database as well so if people want to join the database they can do that we send out weekly inspirational blogs so every friday there's so you know we get on it and we do the blogs and there's always information in there that people can learn and there's always an activity that people can implement as well so our database is growing and growing and growing and there's people all over the world that are part of that and then they always find out about the programs and things that are coming up that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Walt well, Institute is not geared towards just women or just men. Is that correct? So Walt, Walt is actually um, an acronym for Women Authentic Leadership Training okay. Institute. So we started we started because, well, we're women, so we thought, oh, yeah, that works. <laughs> and half our team are, are men, so that's yeah. us. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I love it. And... and um, around that, we target women in STEM. However, fifteen to twenty percent of people we work with are men, mm. so we don't exclude anybody. No. We target women because, as a business, you need to target your niche avatar. And beyond that, it's like we absolutely welcome and embrace mm. anybody who links with our information, and we will absolutely give them totally everything that yep. we've got, just like we give anybody in any of our programs. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I think because I know the men that have been involved in your um, 
your programs that I wasn't aware that it was geared, I suppose, towards women. Now, STEM is hugely male dominated, and there's a lot of things that have sort of come out over the years where uh, the governments and institutions and businesses are trying to to change that. So, are you seeing a bit of a shift? And what can encourage more women to get into STEM? Yeah, there are some shifts. I think if you look at the last decade, there are some shifts. Mm. I think those percentages have gone up to between two and four percent of more women in, in more senior roles. And so, so that's that's a good trajectory. There's, it's it's a multi pronged approach that's yeah. needed. There's a whole lot of things. There's quite a lot of uh, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but this is what people have said to us, that there's an old boys club yeah. in many different institutions where a woman will not actually get a look in. Mm. Or there will be a token woman out of nine people on the board or whatever and one woman because they need to have the representation some way. And so there is still some old school thinking in many yeah. institutions, not all, absolutely not all. No, no. Some of them are very progressive and very supportive of developing women's skills, mm. which is awesome. But you've also got a whole lot of other things around that as well, apart from the actual culture of the organisations, the culture of society. Mm. <laughs> and you've also got practical things because we have some people coming to us going, okay, I'm starting my family, I'm at 35, I'm sort of seven years into post-PhD, decided to start a family before it gets too late, and I went in to tell my boss that I'd like to take maternity leave, and they said, oh, well, I don't think there's any more space here for you on this program. Mm. And so people have sort of unofficially or sort of blatantly <laughs> almost been excluded and and dismissed because they are beginning a family. Other organisations are hugely flexible and going, absolutely do what you need to do. Work from home here, come in mm. here for half a day, bring your child in. There's, there's creches and childcare centres either within some universities or nearby that, that is easy access. And so there's this whole range of things. And then there's this, this, this problem with, or challenge with re-entering as well, re-entering the workforce after you might have had a two, three or five year break because the world of academia and grant applications and publications is all built on your metrics. And if your metrics don't meet the right metrics from the right years and there's a space, then it's like you may not be eligible for a certain um, applications going forward. So there's a system problem. Mm -hmm. There's an attitude problem and I ain't going to call them problems, they are problems. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not going to be able to touch that ourselves at Walton Institute however what we can do is we can strengthen and empower people mm. to put themselves their best their best self forward yeah. and give themselves the best chance of meeting what they need to meet within their careers Look, I think you are indirectly affecting that because you know or even directly you might actually deal with somebody that goes on to become a leader in a, in a large organisation that has the ability to change those policies and practices and that's where change starts to really get traction. So I absolutely believe that, you know, the things that you do definitely have an impact on, you know, wider business. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, though, on, like, gender targets? Do you think they have a place or do you do you think it sort of... Uh, yeah, you answer that first. <laughs> well, we, we have different opinions on this. Go for it. Oh, yeah, okay, love it. <laughs> we do have slightly different opinions yeah. on this. So my opinion is that targets, if you haven't done this before and you're in one of those traditional, rigid-thinking, conservative, male-dominated entities, then a target may be the first step to actually shifting some thoughts mm -hmm. and shifting some thinking and shifting some expectations. Around that, I believe that the, the best person for the job should be appointed for the job. Mm. And we need to be open to our own unconscious biases because we often think, oh, yes, but they're in their 30s, they may have a child and then we'll have to have an interruption in the project. That is often unconscious in some people's minds. It was like, but that's a whole lot of BS mm. because then you're automatically discriminating against those people. And my view is, like, I'm not so hot on the whole idea of having those targets or having 
um, you know, required numbers or saying we need to have 50%, you know, females in here and 50% males. It's like earlier. For me, it is that best person for the job. And that comes from my own belief of if you want it, go after it and get it. And I know that people are like, but I don't know how to go after it. Go and get some help. And it's not to say that they need fixing. And, and I've been called on that a few times. People are like, what? So you say that, that we need fixing. No, 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 no. I'm saying that if you really want to have whatever it is out there, go get it because you can. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's the best person for the job. I, the teams and groups that I've worked in that have been the best has been more blokes in them. Um, you know, our group that we had at Exercise Science at Welltech in, in Wellington was, I think there was, I think maximum three females in the team and the other anywhere between six to eight was always guys. Um, but we worked well together and we had a real mutual respect. And, and for me, that's the, that's the key. It's not about who the person is. It's about what you bring to the team. And, and that, that sort of overshadows everything for me is like, if you're the kind of person that wants to contribute to the team, you're willing to step up, you're willing to pull back, you're willing to be respectful of the people within the team and look at skills and abilities and who the person is, I don't care who you are. Do you think, Christine, that that sort of comes from your sports background where it's so competitive and you have to be the best? It's, it doesn't matter who you are, it's, it's how good you are at what you do. Yeah, it, it, and a lot of it too is be a team person. There's a lot of people that we come across initially within STEM. And, and part of it, I mean, I haven't quite worked out yet whether it's, you know, the personality that's drawn to that situation or the environment that, that pulls out those particular areas of the person. But a lot of people in STEM aren't team people. And part of it is they can't afford, you know, in their perception at that time, they can't afford to be. It's, you know, I need to have this grant or... Um, I need to be the first person to get this done or I'm required to do it and it's all about me or I. And but it's like, hang on a minute, it's about the team and, and when you bring who you are and then other people in the team bring their strengths, that's when you get the best out of each other because then you get this dong, 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 dong and it increases and brings out the best in everyone. And, and yeah, it is, I mean, my, the more that I do this, I see how much, team is a thing for me and that's one thing that I plug with everybody we work with any groups that we work with my thing is that we form a team first and then we go and yeah. here's the culture of the team and if you want to play in this turf you're welcome but if you don't want to play in this turf hell I'll open the gate for you too and I'll close it behind <laughs> you <laughs> with nice turf well, ladies, look, we might leave it there for today because, you know, I think um, our listeners will be able to debate the the um, targets um, yeah. themselves as well. It's good to have one from either side of the fence as well. It's been an interesting take on it. So I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. But before I let you both go, I do have one final question, and that is what would you do differently if only you knew? Uh -huh. I know this one. If only I knew... I was enough <laughs> right from my teenage years things would have been different however where I am today I love who I am and I'm proud of who I am and I'm proud of the contribution and the legacy that I'm leaving on this planet as a leadership coach for our company mm. And you should be proud, Elizabeth. That's awesome. How how does one follow that? <laughs> um if only I knew. Um for me, I think it's to believe in myself of who I be. Um and now I'm being more more me than than I've ever been. And and that's what's allowing me to live, I guess, uh a more solid life and the more I be me whereas before I was scared to be me and I and I think the more I be me I'm I'm bringing out who I truly am I got more strengths than I actually ever was aware that I that I have um and to keep pulling on those things of you know for me it's to have fun it's to be in a team it's to so oh my gosh that stuff works for me when I be me and I put that out there and I don't hide who I be mm then life is sweet. Life is grand. It really is. And and if I'd known that way back then, 
I would have achieved a hell of a lot more. I would have got a lot more places. <laughs> I would have had better friends. I would have had a, a, a really solid, satisfying, awesome life for what I'm having now. Yeah. Well, look, I think you both are inspirations and I thank you so much for everything that you're doing in your space and just in the lives that you touch every day. So if you'd like to know more about Christine and Elizabeth and the Walt Institute, I'll have links to all their socials and their website on my website, if only new podcast.com.au. Thanks, ladies. Thank you Thank so you, much. Christine. It's awesome.